I, I felt like it was time for me to move on away from architecture. So I tried again, maybe last summer or the one before I was working on this interior project in, in Bulgaria again. Uh, and yeah, I was thinking to myself again, why am I doing this? <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Creative Insider Podcast. In this episode, my guest is Greta Stefanova. She's a Bulgarian architect. She has worked among different countries. She has been in Italy, Germany, Finland, Spain. And through moving around, through being this architectural nomad, she figured out a great idea that was the core of her new startup she co-founded with a friend of her who is a doctor. And the startup is called WISP, and it is about relocating easily expats around the world. It's a very interesting story about living architecture and starting something new. So I suggest you to listen to the full podcast with Greta. Before we start, I want to thank you for the support by watching this podcast. And I want to remind you that this project is possible only thanks to donations. So if you want, you can join our Patreon group. You'll find the link below. And... Your name will be in the thank you credits for every episode. Also, you will have the access to our monthly call with our community. I hope to see you there. And if you cannot afford to support the podcast, I'll be very happy if you press that subscribe button. Thank you very much and enjoy the podcast with Greta Stefanova. And we are live. Good morning, Greta. Welcome to the Creative Insider Podcast. Good morning, Thank you for having me. I found you through a very ironic situation. Um, my mother saw you on Bulgarian TV and <laughs> she told me, there is this girl I saw on TV. She's an architect and she's brilliant and uh, you should check on her and try to invite her on your podcast. And I was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to Google her and see what she does. And then I thought it's really interesting um, your background. So can you explain quickly in a short form to the people what you're currently doing? What is your current daily life and what is your job now? Cool. Well, that, that's that's a nice intro, actually. <laughs> Thanks to your mom. <laughs> Say hi. <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm, uh, well, actually, I founded uh, my startup some two, three years ago, actually two years ago. Um, right before COVID, the COVID pandemic. Um, and yeah, currently we, we deal with uh, expats relocation. So basically our slogan is we solve bureaucracy and healthcare for expats. Um, we created a little technological product that actually um, navigates people step-by-step step through the process of relocation on an, an administrative um, point of view. Um, yeah, this is what I basically do currently. Yeah, this is a very interesting startup, but uh, for me it was interesting because when I was researching you, as I told you, I saw what might be the uh, reason for that. So I think it's going to be interesting to understand a little bit your background and your career before the startup. Uh, mm -hmm. So you were educated as an architect and as far as I understood, you study in, in Milan in the Politecnico. Uh, right. How come up... How did you come with the idea of becoming an architect and studying architecture? Why did you decide for that? Well, basically, um, yeah, I, I started off actually my um, upper education in Holland. Um, I started um, studying uh, interactive media design in, in um, the Royal Academy of Art in The Hague. And at some point I decided that I needed more focus in, in the sense that um, we were having so many different subjects that were so um, interesting for me, but it seemed like they were um, kind of too short for, for me to get more profound into each topic. So at some point I was brainstorming and I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do with my life? I, I need to focus and I need something that is actually going to give me um, some clear um, outcome of, of the study like I, I didn't know how could I um, realize myself as a creative director back back at the times because it was some yeah basically almost 10 years ago even more 15 um, 
And then I was like, hey, you know, my parents have always told me architecture is a great um, field of study. Like, why don't you do this? You draw really well. Um, actually, my dad um, was a scenographer and um, he was the artist in the family. So basically, I kind of like um, got it after him. Um, but for me, architecture was just the more uh, rectangular way to to put art in, in reality at the very beginning. I don't know. I had this kind of perception that there are artists who are super arts farts and super cool and creative. And then there are architects who, who take this art and, and put it in, in some like very rigid uh, shapes. Um, eventually, I, I grew to understand that that was nearly not the case. Um, and yeah, I started studying in Politecnico. I was there for four years. Politecnico di Milano is actually the... Polytechnic University um, in, um, in Milan, basically, it teaches all the uh, different fields of study that engineers, architects could um, could learn. Um, the, the, the last year I decided to do Erasmus and I applied to go to Lisbon, where I studied for a year in uh, UTL. So it's uh, Universidade Tecnica de Lisboa. Uh, so basically, I studied there. I, I went back to... Milan to graduate and um, I actually started off with my professional career in Munich um, so it was a very like uh, as, as you can see very uh, flowy situation for me because I was really changing um, the country more or less quite often um, so eventually yeah I started working uh, for a big corporation in, in Munich um, we were I was part of their creative uh, well, let's say corporate solution team. Um, uh, architectural we, corporation on what kind of office was it? Yeah, it, it was more like a real estate. Uh, so we would mainly design office spaces. Um, and, and yeah, this is how I started, actually. I, I had done a couple of internships in Portugal and in Milan um, where I could actually have uh, a notion of how the, uh, you know, architectural scene is. Uh, Portugal was quite impressive in, in terms of, you know, the studio where I worked. Um, it was called Arteria. So they had very nice, um, not only architectural, but also urban projects for, you know, the regeneration of the city. And um, they were really cool. Two, two really powerful ladies uh, who did that. So, yeah, eventually I moved to Munich. I started off with my professional career there and um some months after, maybe half a year after, I, I realized that this is this is not a the, the dream job I was looking for um, right after graduating university because you know back then I realized the huge gap between uh, the university studies and and the professional life of architecture because you get to have all these like unlimited budgets, unlimited um, briefs where you can really design something super incredible and creative and then you end up in the real life where you have all the regulations all the you know limitations in terms of budget all the limitations in terms of you know what the customer wants and um of course what what the upper management wants and how do they want it so um i started like realizing that there was a huge gap and i probably wanted to look for something more um creative actually at the very beginning, right before hiring me, uh, my future boss to be back then was like, oh, I think you're too crazy for this job. But back at the time, I had two or three other offers in uh, different architectural studios in Munich. And to be honest, I don't know why I, I really chose this one. It, it sounded like the better deal in terms of like, hey, I really have the potential to grow inside this bigger company. Um, and then I eventually, like looking back, I thought to myself, maybe I could have actually learned way more in a smaller team where you don't really have the potential to grow uh, professionally, but at least you have the, the capacity and, you know, the environment to learn a lot of things and to really have to deal with them on your own. Um, so, yeah, that's how it happened. I, I eventually moved to Finland um, due to personal reasons, um, my 
yeah, my partner back at the time had to relocate to Finland. So I switched the country again. I, I had a job offer in Zurich, which I basically said no to. It was a, a very nice studio. I even went um, live for an interview and they really selected me. But as you can imagine, the conditions were not awesome. It was the usual deal. You know, come here, you can work for this great office. We're going to pay you. Um, just a little at the very beginning, but then you, you you can grow. So at this point, I was already you know coming back, coming from the corporate world, so I was used to like way better financial conditions, and um, I said no because I felt like it would be a downgrade to my to my you know professional involvement. Um, but again, later on in time, I figured that money wasn't everything, and maybe that. The, the decisions I had taken were not exactly the right ones, but uh, I was lucky enough to meet my new boss in Helsinki uh, through his his girlfriend. <laughs> it was like a very uh, crazy situation because I was actually visiting this other um, office um, and she was like, hey, what do you do? Like, are you Bulgarian? Because... Uh, for, for, for Finnish people, it was quite exotic to have some, you know, uh, random Europeans just going to live there, right? It's not like um, people would choose Finland as their preferable destination. So um, she was asking me around and at some point I told her, hey, I'm, I'm an architect. Um, so if you know anything, she was like, yes, my boyfriend is starting this new project, a, a very nice luxury house. So... Uh, he's looking for for people, <laughs> and that's how it happened. Like eventually, I sent him my portfolio. He invited me for a you know trial day. Um, then it went well, and then I got the job. Eventually, he was like, "Hey, I have to introduce you to my friend because I was, um, um, yeah, I was working for for two offices at the same time at at some point when I was in Finland." Uh, so I got to really experience two different office cultures there as well. Um, and to be honest, that, that really taught me a lot because um, they were smaller studios, uh, architectural studios. So I really got to um, get into the detail and um, really go on site. And, and it was quite fascinating to be able to design a sauna or a sauna house for every project you do. <laughs> so something that had never happened to me before, um, let's say, in the Mediterranean uh, part of the world. How and many yeah. how many years in your career you were when you moved to Finland? So how many years you stayed in, in Munich and, and how many years experience so you had when you started working there? Uh, more or less a year of experience before I started working in Finland. And then in Finland, I, I kind of survived for a year. And by by saying survived, I mean that you, you can imagine the climatic conditions and um, it was a bit different. So I think that I only survived because I really uh, took it as, as a very exotic experience that I would never maybe have in my life again. Um, but it was exciting uh, because, you know, the, the white nights and then... Uh, have the night all over the day was something very different. And this this is what made, made me understand that, you know, um, their approach to design and to architecture was so minimal and so neat, maybe just because they were coming out of an environment that really, um, I don't know, it's, it's a very humble um, environment out there in Finland. So I could really see Alvar Alto's buildings live. And, and for me, it was super exciting, right? Because I, I really admire this architect. Um, and then I could understand, hey, you can see see it in, on the streets, right? The curbs, the uh, pavement, everything is, you know, set down with a lot of potential to detail and um, in a very clean and neat way. So... Uh, for me, it was interesting to see the different approach to architecture as well, right? Germany is way more probably utilitarian, so things have to be... Efficient. <laughs> um, you have to be able to put more people in the same space because you, you don't want to waste space because this is a waste of, of money. Uh, whereas in Finland, you have a way more different approach. 
also because territorially Finland is like a huge land, huge piece of land, which is uh, which has the density of uh, Bulgaria, which is basically six million people, or six, seven, eight million people. But then you have a huge piece of land that is not really inhabited or inhabited because of the climatic conditions. So eventually, people would have the space to go wider with their buildings, and probably um, I could notice that even the building blocks, um, the older ones would be two floor height or three floor, floor height. Whereas um, in Munich, you have this completely different um, approach to contemporary architecture. So um, yeah, that was a great experience for me. But again, you see, I'm, I'm relocating from a country to a country and I was facing the same issues all over again. And um, I would like often, as all architects, get like... Um, backache because <laughs> I have some, like issues with my spine due to like sitting on the computer for long hours um, and I would eventually always need a doctor so um, the first and foremost thing I would have to do when I would move to a new country was to figure out okay how do I get access to healthcare how do I register myself like how do I start working uh, when I don't even have like a tax number so um, I had to find out, again, the hard way, so asking people, going around institutions, calling phones. Um, well, of course, as you can imagine, Finland was very efficient and everything happened very quickly and um, stress-free, whereas Germany is a more bureaucratic country, so for me it was a bit more complicated to figure out what I had to do. Um, and then, yeah, at the end of the journey in Finland, I say end of the journey because it was clear that I wouldn't stay and live there forever. So I uh, had to make a move. Then I basically relocated for several months in Madrid because why not? Just changing the, <laughs> changing the weather. Um, and at this point, I started looking for a job in Spain, but um, basically the offers I could discover were so... Uh, I would call them disrespectful because they were really offering like uh, just that much money for, you know, the amount of work that each architect knows that you have to do once you embark on a new role. It was basically not a, not the greatest deal. And still Madrid wasn't like the cheapest place to live. So you need to earn money to, to have a nice um, life standard. So yeah, uh, I got... Um, a job offer in, in Turin, in Milan, oh, well, in, in, <laughs> in Italy. <laughs> yeah. So I decided to go back. Um, How was it there? Because I'm curious, because you said Madrid was very disrespectful. And what I hear from Italy, this I mean, I studied in Italy myself. I grew up in Italy, uh, in Rome. Uh, and I left even before graduating because it was impossible to, to hope for something uh even Eight. okay. So I'm curious <laughs> how you moved back to Italy after Munich and Finland. Well, I I had already learned my lesson um, because as I started and I told you like, um, hey, I kind of chose um, better financial conditions over what I would look for in a job at the very beginning of my career. So this time it was like, hey, I know that I have to downgrade because I'm going to a country with a lower life standard. And this was basically the pitch that the CEO of the company back then gave me. It's like, you know, that we cannot offer you the same salary that you're getting in Finland, but we will try to match it somehow. Of course, it was far away from matching it. But uh, again, like my life, lifestyle and the, the expenses I would have in Turin will be probably three, to, three times lower than what what I would pay in, in Finland for rent and so on. Um, so, yeah, it was actually not a bad deal also because the company that I started working for was quite popular. It, it looked very exciting. The interview approach was, wow, like seriously, I had to present this Petra Kuchi style presentation. So it's 2.4 minutes uh, presentation on my project in front of... Um, the whole team so basically they had the 
meeting lunch every Wednesday and the whole team would get together and they would evaluate me first. So basically my co colleagues to be. Um, after they voted me, yes, um, basically I had a meeting with the CEO and then eventually, no, actually with, with the boss of the company and then with the CEO. Uh, so three very like chaotic and random, well, probably the last one was uh, the more structured one because of, you know, the CEO was... What exactly was the presentation you had to do? Sorry. Well, it's called Pecha Kucha. Uh, so it's basically you have several seconds per slide. And the, the point was to present uh, something that I find interesting or, or something that represents me throughout my projects. So basically I had to show them like what I have been working on and how and what is my approach to architecture in general. Um, and this is something I found very cool. So I thought to myself, hey, look at these very young and cool people that are like, asking me questions, I would like to be part of their team. Um, and I would like to work on the project that they were working on because this was a, more of a design and innovation company. So basically we were also implementing a lot of innovation in, into the project. And all of the projects that we do, we, we had some like spin-off startup companies with like different uh, robotic or... Um, well, what, there was a robotic bar. There was like um, um, this kind of, um, not chair, but a, a seating that would move around so it would fit your like body posture with sensors. And um, it was pretty exciting um, when I started off. Eventually, of course, I, I grew, I end up in the same situation that I had ended up in, at school. Uh, so in, in the university where we basically didn't sleep all night long and, <laughs> you know, the, the work conditions were eventually starting to be quite heavy because, you know, um, with the stream of time, you kind of get older and you cannot really resist uh, this pace anymore. Um, so at some point I, I started like being really dissatisfied with my way of life because I was uh, working on competition after competition. We had limited time. Um, of course, there was always like compromising with the amount of people who would be working on the project with respect to the scope of the project. So um, I ended up being really like physically exhausted. Um, and that was the time that I decided to myself, hey, um, my journey in Italy uh, started as with me not feeling my legs on the chair again. Uh, so I ended up in the hospital and then afterwards I started receiving these bills uh, for what I had done uh, as in terms of exams. And, and I was asking my employer, hey, sorry, am I not health insured? Like, what? I'm, I'm working on a contract and like you're not paying my health insurance. And they're like, of course we are, but we think you have to register yourself somewhere. And I was like, oh, great. <laughs> that sounds like awesome. Like Italian administration and bureaucracy, I have to register myself somewhere. So it was a goal figure situation. And I really, uh, I, I will never forget the moment when I was having these really back, like back pain issues. And I had to go from an institution to an institution where, where basically I would uh, end up at eight o'clock in the morning in front of this desk and they would tell me, oh no, it's closed. And I was like, well, your time, like your working hours start at 8.30. And they were like, sure, but the numbers, like the tickets are already gone because people go there like half an hour earlier and they would like finish all the, the tickets. And I was like, how is it possible? And they're like, well, we close at 12 o'clock, so you have to go to the other building, which is probably, like, far away. Um, so, yeah, and I did. And it was a very horrific experience. And uh, eventually all of my new colleagues in the company would be sent out to me. So I would give them orientation on what they would have to do in order to fix their healthcare and to actually register as residents in the country so they could use, like, you know, even have a postal address or something, um, or park their car, and I don't know. And um, 
I had this like thought in my head because ever since I was a student, all of my classmates and all the people that I would hang out with would, you know, um, joke with me and would use me as an information point when it comes to their, hey, how do I go to the doctor? How do I fix my ID card and stuff like that? So I was like, uh, you know, the Wikipedia of uh, <laughs> fix, fix your administrative shit. Um, I can tell you a funny story because I had the same problem, of course, because I arrived from Italy to Germany and at the beginning I barely knew even the language. So every time I started working on a new place, I designated myself, one of my colleagues, as my life coaches, I would call them. I would ask them all the possible questions about health insurance, um, I don't know, car insurances, uh, everything, how it's done, how much it costs. So it's so funny because I have had that, but I... Uh, figured out that someone at the office knew stuff, usually people with kids and family. True. Yeah, I've had situations where I basically need, needed to ask for help to fill in my documents because I could speak the language, but uh, I mean, asking some crazy administrative shit that I couldn't even understand, like what, what, what do they want me to put here? So the documents were written in such a formal way that I couldn't even like... Yeah, as someone that has lived in Italy, I can say that Germany compared is like a heaven. It's, yeah. it's yeah. just easy. <laughs> True, even though some parts of uh, residing in Germany, like for example, opening a bank account or closing the bank account was like, oh, I have to, you know, donate blood to the country because otherwise they're not letting me go. Uh, like you had to go always in person to the office. And it was, I found it very frustrating. So I, I really hope that nowadays things are way easier. Um, but yeah, so this is how it all started. I, I decided to change my lifestyle. I was like um, sick and tired of, you know, overworking, uh, being a bit underpaid um, with respect to the amount of work I would have. Of course, I was happy and grateful that I was actually having a real working contract in Italy and, you know, working in this very exciting company. Um, but at some point I, I couldn't take it anymore. Um, just, I, I just needed to get some sleep and <laughs> I needed to, to be able to go to the office half an hour later in the morning when I had been working until, you know, late night, late night hours the night before. And I needed nobody to make a point out of this because, uh, I was sacrificing my own free time and well being uh, for, for the sake of, you know, pulling off some cool projects. And eventually we did, but yeah, the stress was too much and the physical stress was too much. So I was like, hey, I, I got to do something. Then I had a little, it wasn't a, a sabbatical, but let's say I, I got to like, I came back to Bulgaria. Um, I had a little trip to Turkey. Then I went visiting my family in, um, in the States. Before this, I passed by Milan. And initially my... My idea was to go back to Italy and to open up my company there, um, to start up um, a business there, not not a company. Like at this time, there was it was clearly not even close to a company. Um, but then I started making some calculations, and I was like, you know what? It will be so much more expensive to be self-sustained uh, in Italy uh, to you know run a business and to have accounting there and to pay taxes there. Why don't I stay in the little tax heaven that Bulgaria is and try and pulling it out from here? Eventually, maybe one of the markets that I could work for could be Italian market. And uh, this is how I started. Like I, I actually learned for this pre-accelerator program from an expat in Bulgaria. Uh, what did you learn? I didn't understand you. The last sentence. Uh, it's a pre-accelerator program for basically idea stage startups, very like early stage uh, startups from a German guy at, a, at an exhibition. We just very much like, it was curious for me what he was doing in Bulgaria. And then he was like, hey, uh, if you're looking for um, 
you know, work or meeting friends that have lived abroad and came back here, you can check out this uh, um, NGO. And then he sent me to their website. And then I saw this advertising banner of this pre-accelerator program. And I was like, well, why don't, why don't I apply? Like, it's it sounds like the the good fit. And back at the time, I had many ideas in my head. I, I wanted to probably start with different businesses. But um, yeah, eventually I came back to the origin. So I was like, there is really this problem. And then I, I really don't manage to still find a decent solution of it. And I would really love to be able to pay someone who will tell me everything I have to do. And um, yeah, that I could do it self-service without being a burden for my friends or for my colleagues and going around and asking me, can you help me with this document? Or, hey, where do I have to go? And calling phones and so on. So this is how it all started. And then that's when you come up with the idea of starting the 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 company that was nothing to do with architecture, but it was exactly this. It was helping um, people that are moving somewhere else uh, abroad to work to to help them with all this stuff that if they didn't know they must they might have been in a problematic position as you in Italy yeah uh, I missed the first part of your sentence because it was breaking up no I was uh, saying and that's the moment where you decided to start a company that's nothing to do with architecture but helping this problem that you have experienced yourself yeah Actually, I was working a bit in architecture when I came back to Bulgaria. Like right away, I had like, um, you know, friends of friends who would tell me basically, hey, um, you know, you can, there's this opportunity in this company. So basically, I did one competition in Bulgaria as well. Then I was offered um, to do another project, but I, I didn't really want to go back there. Like it was enough because also this this experience was not. Um, I I felt like it was time for me to move on away from architecture. So I tried again maybe last summer, or the one before. I was working on this interior project in in Bulgaria again. Uh, and yeah, I was thinking to myself again, why am I doing this? <laughs> How? I'm curious because we have had a um, couple of um, people. Uh, from um, the Harvard graduates and they wrote this book called Out of Architecture and they have a com consultancy company which is called Out of Architecture and they help architects um, f figure out uh, the way out of architecture and use their skills to, to do something else as you did. Um, when, you, when you come up with the idea to start uh, the WISP, the company that you're uh, now working on, um, did you feel, did you have any, you know, doubts? Because, for example, I'm in architecture since I started studying and working 10 years now in, and it's kind of who I am, right? You are a little bit what you do for a living. When, you, when people ask you, what do you do? You say, I'm an architect. Was it for you hard to abandon the idea of being an architect anymore? Or was it at a level that it was that hectic that you didn't care at all? Um, it's a good point. I, I have often thought about this. And I think that I had, um, I had reached a, a level, a certain level when I would only get the negative out of the job or maybe I would only see the negative out of this job um, and the negatives were always related to the fact that I wasn't happy uh, right so I was excited about what I do and I was really burning and living for it as most architecture people like uh, uh, students and professionals would do so I would find myself invested so much in the project and, and, and giving in so much energy but then receiving no, no re rewarding feelings afterwards. So like at the end of the day, I was just tired and I was happy that I could get some sleep. 
So this is the time when I thought to myself, this is not the lifestyle I want to have anymore. Even though I love architecture and I admire people who do this and I've, you know, there's, there's a certain level of arrogance that we architects have uh, because it's, it's very nice and it sounds a bit posh when you say, what do you do? I'm an architect, right? So it's, it's like, oh my God. Like the, for me, the only job that is a bit, uh, that is more complicated than architecture is being a doctor, right? So if you say I'm a doctor, you're like, oh my God, you're saving lives. You're, you're helping people live longer. And, you know, um, you're like a Superman. Um, and then there's the architect who's like, hey, like because of you, we, we live in this nice square um, <laughs> like spaces and or know. not so nice <laughs> depending on the architect <laughs> but but still like i was for me there is a certain level of admiration for this job because i know how hard it is to to go get through the education and how hard it is to actually enter the professional world and how hard it is to build a name especially for those who, who are building names in architecture um but at some point, this feeling inside of me, like I, I, I would still call myself, hey, uh, what do you do? I'm an architect. Uh, but now, basically, after a little time off and after I haven't really put my hand on on any CAD software or any like 3D software for for some time, I was like, you know what? I I don't miss calling myself an architect anymore because... I am not practicing anymore. Like I, I will always have the admiration for architecture and for all these like um, great architectural pieces that I have always looked up to. Uh, but in the same time, I don't miss the lifestyle. Um, and I don't miss being unhappy uh, with, with my life. So this is something I, I definitely found worth giving up for um the title <laughs> yeah indeed and and so you figure out this uh, ngo this startup accelerator and you had this idea so can you walk me through a little bit the story and the process of uh, starting up a company from zero in something that was new what exactly is the product that you guys have developed uh, i'm really interested because it's something that uh, you know you hear some stories about someone that has a startup or that has done something, but um, no, not so detailed. It's just so the you know the fancy flair of starting up. So if you if you can walk through us through what was your experience in that in that field? Yeah, well, um, now that I I think back starting a company um well it, it's not even a company at the very beginning like i i found the approach to uh building something new let's call it like this because every, everybody's now now startups are so popular right everything is called called a startup what is a startup actually a startup is a um is a small team of people that are able to pull it off quickly and build something that brings a lot of value and that has the potential to scale fast. Uh, unlike small businesses that are called small businesses because they are, you know, they only have a limited scope of, of work or maybe a limited scope geographically. Uh, so startup has the potential to scale. This is this is the very difference. And startups usually uh, evolve and. Um, modify way faster than, than standard companies. This is why they're, let's say that startups are a bit deprived of processes or internal, that much internal organization at the beginning, because you're always like um, catching up with time and you always have to be like um, doing the job of let's say, at least two or three people within the team. And I found that the approach of architecture is more or less the same, like uh, bringing up an idea, an architectural concept to life uh, has pretty much the, the similar process to what startups need to do. It's just more complex and it's more complete uh, because I, I realized that what was missing 
when I was on, in architecture, for me personally, uh, was the overall overview of the situation. So how we would approach architecture was like, you are giving a brief, right? The customer, the client brief, and then you got to build, build something around it. But then there were so many little unknowns that maybe the project management or the C-level um, positions in the architectural company would know and you will not be given for some reason, which I tend to call a bit bad leadership because now when I'm working, I, I tend to always give like overview to my team. Okay, we are doing this because... The customer, there's a customer who... So this is something that I was lacking in architecture. Usually when you work in an architectural company and there's this burned out boss that comes in and says, you got to do this and you're going to do it now. I really hated this approach, but in the same time, the overall approach is the same. Like you have a problem that derives from a customer. They say, hey, I would like to build a house or hey, I would like to modify my house or this building block. Or the investor who says, like, I want to sell, like, 120 apartments. Um, and then you, you get the brief, right? You, it has to look like this. It has to be confined with the limits and so on. You have the same in the startup world. You derive from a problem that is, like, a global problem, mostly, or something that you find problematic and then you validate with the market. And then you derive from the customer needs to actually bring up a product that would solve their problem. This is more or less the same with architecture, right? You, you, you get the brief, you have the customer, their problem is I need a place to live or it, it has to be a two or three um, room apartment and then you provide for them. And then actually receiving their feedback, you get to shape it in a way that it would fit their, their needs the best. This is more or less the approach to startups as well, right? You build off a minimum viable product of, of, of your solution to this very problem. And then you start like modifying it and molding it so it would fit the market, it would fit the customer better. Because the more you talk to the customer, the more you understand how you can improve and modify what you're providing them. Um, but then, of course, coming from architecture, I was lacking many pieces of the puzzle. For example, I, I never knew the budget. I never knew the, uh, who exactly the client is. I, most, most of the times, you don't even get to speak to the client. You probably speak to the C-level people or the sales or the business development team, and they give you the brief. So in this case, what I love is actually having direct contact to the, with the customer and being able to bring the pieces together, meaning that you talk to the customer or the potential customer, they tell you, hey, this is my problem. Then you figure out how to approach it and how to solve it for them. Then you give them the solution and ask them feedback. Oh, how does it look? And they're like, oh, that's cool, but this is a bit shitty. You can approve this. So this is the cycle of developing a solution I find very exciting. And the approach to it is very human-centric because at the end of the day, you really derive from the real need and then you provide the real solution. Um, but to go a step back, um, this is uh, the iteration, yeah, the startup method, so to say. Um, but um, in your case, from the moment you had, because a lot of people might have ideas right you you in your case was this idea that was out of your personal experience so the moment you had the idea i can do something a startup that solves this problem for for expats um how did you so you need some budget you need somebody to talk to because it's a, a technological thing. So uh, you need also some other kind of experience to build, uh, whether it's a website or a program. Or So I'm very curious about the very beginning of the moment you had the idea about from this idea, how you end up with your what was your minimal viable product and, and so on. How did you put the things together? It, the funny thing is that at the very beginning, the idea was not even... Um, I had the idea of having like this uh, product that would help people get access to healthcare, but eventually me and my team wanted to build medical records on blockchain. 
<laughs> so <laughs> I'm laughing because it's, it, it sounds pretty unrealistic to me when I, when I even hear it. Uh, but um, you see, the idea modified a lot because we really started validating. So first I found this like little team in the pre-accelerator program that is no longer the same team that we are. Um, there were like some participants in the program that joined me and we started like looking for, for, you know, the right idea and the right thing to pull off and actually took us quite a lot of time to, um, to say, okay, we're doing this and we're carrying on with it, with it. So eventually when we decided to build something around healthcare, and this is also why our first domain was WISP Health and not WISP. Um, I contacted this really cool girl that I had met at the party uh, and she was a doctor and we spoke about medical stuff for like over two hours at, at the birthday party. So then I invited her for like a customer interview basically uh, because, you know, if you're making a medical record, you need to have doctor's feedback to know what's what. So this is one of the ways you learn more about the market and about what you're going to do. Actually talking to people who are in this sector and learning directly from them. So I, I went to speak to a lot of doctors and I liked her so much that I was like, you know what, we're doing this per accelerator program and um, it's called Beyond, by the way. Um, if anybody's interested, <laughs> you can ping me. Um, and I was like, why don't you join one of the lectures once and maybe you would be happy to join our team. Maybe it could be useful. And then she was like, yeah, I would love doing this. So basically she joined my team and until today we're still uh, co-founders. Basically she, she remains in the team and she's basically the doctor uh, on the team. So at the point when we graduated, I call it graduated the pre-accelerator program, we had these competitions going on. Uh, organized by the pre-accelerator. We went on a European level, like um, not uh, competing with other European teams from this uh, junior achievement network. Basically, there was junior achievement uh, European enterprise. Um, uh, not sure, but yeah, it was something like a competition, right? Yeah. And... Um, we participated, we won some awards from Microsoft. So basically we, we earned some cash, little cash back then. How did you uh, participate? What is the, what do you show up? Uh, so basically we had to pitch. Uh, this is how you present your startup usually. So you was just a presentation was like, this is our idea. We would love to do this, but currently we're not being able to do anything of this. Uh, no, because we had already managed to build a little website with a landing page where we, we would start like collecting, um, um, how do you say, interest. So basically we had a little contact form and people would subscribe to ask us questions or just to, to validate if there's some interest. And back in the time, I, I had some idea of how this could look like. And back in the time, I had a very architectural approach towards what I would do because I would go very visual. And I found myself back in the days really focusing on the graphics, on the detail, on how I would actually make this uh, landing page look like and so on. So um, now I, I have changed because you have to be way more lean and dirty and not waste so much time on detail. Um so yeah, I was like approaching it from a very visual perspective. I would always like draw it or put it on paper. And I'm like, I, I, I think it could look like this. Let's see if it would work like this. Um, eventually the niche and the product that we chose to pull off uh, happened to be quite challenging because it's a niche market. So basically you're targeting this very small funnel of people who would only relocate Sometimes, right? There's not like people buying T-shirts every day. And yeah. Like you have this very niche segment and a very niche market. But I had the notion that this makes us very much different from everything else that there's on the market. And I found it brilliant to find a solution for this because what I was lacking before in my life was a cause, right? We're building all these beautiful buildings, but where's the cause? Whereas 
we're building a product that is going to really facilitate people move and travel around stress-free. This is like, whoa, if this happens on a global level, we have done something meaningful for society, right? And, and people are going to be happy with this. So this was the goal. And this was like um, the first thing I learned for startups. You need to have a vision and a mission, right? So the mission tells you where you want to be in five years. And the vision tells you how you want to go there. And this really helped me figure out, hey, right, um, where do we want to be in five years? How do we want the product to look like? So we started like this, drawing all these little schemes, um, typically for an architect, like little diagrams showing like how the process would look like. Then eventually I, I grew to learn that there's like the thing called UX, so user experience and user design which follows um, the user behavior until the point you, you reach an outcome. Uh, so basically everything in a website is built around the user behavior. How do you interact with a website uh, in a way that it will be easier for you to log in, in, in a way that it will be the easiest thing in the world to, to make a payment and so on. Um, so again, like it was like building a building but it was not really a physical thing. It was a digital thing. Um, and one of, the, one of the points where I, I loved going away from the world of architecture is that there is nothing tangible, like physically tangible anymore. Because it's one thing to have to deal with construction workers at the site. You know, usually they're not the nicest people, especially when it comes to women, especially when you're in southern, uh, in the southern hemisphere where people would usually uh, be like, I go to the construction site with my colleague and they're like, hey, Mr. Architect, and you? And I'm like, uh, I'm the other architect. And they're like, all right, you girl, right? Like the, the attitude was different because very physical and you get to to work with people on offline whereas i was really trying to escape this world um and and build something in the digital environment sorry i i get to like uh, no 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 it's okay that's why it's a podcast you can explain <laughs> the story from your point of view i was <laughs> thinking about it actually that it's funny that um, you if, co-founded the company with another woman and i myself get criticized a lot that i don't invite enough women on this podcast but the reality is that i invite a lot of them but a lot of them say no so <laughs> so, Why? so it's not my case hmm. you know what i it's there there's something weird that i have been thinking about why are there not so many women in involved in, in especially in um, maybe nowadays there are a lot of women in architecture but let's say there's not many women in engineering there's not many women in construction um, and so on and I remember back in the time in university we had Grafton Architects visiting uh, you know Grafton there's like a very nice Irish company um, and I asked them themselves like why aren't there any like great female architect before Zaha did, right? What what happened to Minalto and like, why did they always stay in the shadow? And they were like, you know what? We're wondering about the same thing. Somehow all of our good students drop out at some point or decide to, you know, uh, stay at home and make a family. And, you know, they just give up the, the, the job. And probably it's the same with startups. I was also thinking to myself, why are there so many guys in the startup world and not so many? And maybe the answer is logical. Like at some point, women start like giving births, right? And that really takes like one or two years of your lifetime. And then you have to go back, back in the game. And then you have to like make connections again and, you know, network and start off your career. For me, the um, thing so is maybe that... This is that after you have a kid, no matter if you're a man or a woman, that's a thing, you, your priority change. Because now your mm, priority is completely shifted. I noticed that at work, when I work with women that don't have kids and have kids, that's a big difference. And um, also with, with men that f 
have a kid or not have a kid, um, you can see that they can be way more, they're actually very good for the team because they're not so worried about the work because they have this child that is their main problem in the sense that they really will be affected if something wrong went with the child. With the child. And I think that's a big role, no matter if you're a woman or a man. I think both cases are affected by it. For sure they're affected um, psychologically, but I meant more like time-wise, right? You have this gap where you have to you know give birth and you are incapable of working and then you have to take care of the child like usually women take care more of the, their children so you have this like huge gap career gap um well of course there are women especially in the states where where they don't have the privilege to have such long maternity leave and they would have to like hire nannies and stuff but especially in europe i could see like this very long maternity leave and maybe this is one of the points that breaks things in the middle and then the other thing is that i find women a bit more not humble but uh probably more insecure when it comes to um saying things out loud i don't know why usually women are so loud <laughs> and when they have to pull something off they kind of stand back maybe also because we're more emotional so really business has to be very much deprived of emotion you still have emotional intelligence because you work with people, but still like uh, sometimes business is harsh and it's very disgusting to have, to have this like very male energy all around you. And, you know, this mm, testosterone that is always trying to uh, kind of put you down and saying, Hey, little girl, you don't know what you're doing. And you're like, Hey, maybe no, but I'm not a little girl. So let's yeah. talk this <laughs> the thing is that I, I've, um, there is this guy, Jordan Peterson. I, have, I don't know if you have heard about him. He's a little bit uh, now gone too far in the last years with uh, his political views, in my opinion. But he's a um, psychiatrist, something like that. Um, and he says that, for example, one of the reasons for gender pay gap is that uh, women generally are more agreeable. Uh, they tend to agree more with something not going wrong and i noticed that for example at work is just um, my personal anecdotal experience is that sometimes when you have a shitty boss and me as a guy i fight back i'll be like i'm not doing this stuff um, i'm not agreeing with this guy he's wrong and my colleagues that happen to be women they more like yeah but what you're gonna do about it, it and there are also men like this but they <clears throat> the reason for on the vast scale is that probably psychologically women are more agreeable and but there are also some people like you that are not agreeable so it's not like a general rule for everyone so but i think that that might be a reason i don't know i have no data this guy says this sounds like reasonable yeah it sounds it sounds like something legit i i had a lot of colleagues uh especially in, in Italy, who would be very agreeable with the, with the things that would happen to them. They were reluctant, of course, to accept them and, and agree that they're correct. But I was always like the dark sheep, like the syndicalist of the, of the, of the team saying like, no, this is not the correct way to approach the market. And um, generally, I would always fight back. And to be honest, I would... I would um, end up having a very negative response because people wouldn't be used to have this like rebel um, you know positioning of of someone uh, let it be a, a woman from eastern europe so probably because we are yeah, from bulgaria was... we are that way because we don't accept we we we, we were abroad or i'm abroad because i want better conditions so if the condition drops i was like i didn't come for this stuff <laughs> I stopped hearing you, something happened to your microphone. I don't hear you anymore. You can try to rejoin. No. <clears throat> so we have a little break to see 
if she'll manage to rejoin the conversation. Hey, you hear me? Uh, now I hear you. You're back. Sorry. Something happened uh, to your microphone. My phone rang, so th this is what happened. But um, yeah, I'm generally thinking that there is something, and maybe Uncle Freud <laughs> can tell us more about it. But there is something about women in business that um, that gives a little difference. Like I, I could also notice it in Germany that uh, generally women after their thirties, like most women, would stay home and take care of their kids. And um, probably I am coming from a family where my both parents have always been uh, working together. They had their their own advertising agency, which my mom is still running because my daddy passed away uh this year last year um and yeah i i could always see her like in this entrepreneurial light so i i have always had i was re being brought up with this kind of environment at home where my parents would always speak about which was not great of course which would, they would speak about work and clients and issues and they would always like you know maybe have a little fight over it but I could always hear this, uh, you know, the very much business um, talks and environment around me, including my mom, who would be the business lady. Then I had my grandma, uh, who also passed away, unfortunately, last year. I'm, I'm um, sorry for your loss, by the way. I, I remember when I watched an uh, interview uh, on that I rewatched your interview on TV. That what that was one of the reasons why you moved back also to to Bulgaria, I guess, to be closer to your family. Yeah, well, my dad was not sick uh, when I moved back, but um, I was happy that I was already back when when this happened, because yeah. Uh, but nevertheless, yeah, my my um, my grandma. Uh, who passed away, unfortunately, uh, she would start off her own um, bracelet company, like Martinica. We have this traditional bracelet in Bulgaria that we wear, wear around the first days of March. Uh, so she would handmade them. And at the age of 80, uh, she would like start producing like huge quantities of those and sell them. And she would even start selling them in the States <laughs> because my aunt lived there. So she would like send her over, um, uh, you know, Martinitzas, like these bracelets and, and, you know, expand her market even to the States. So I was like, at the age of 80, this is impressive because she was someone who couldn't really stay still and stay at home. Then my other grandma, who's my dad's um, mom, and, and she's still uh, alive and with us, thank God. She's like 90 three years old, uh, well, even four now. <laughs> She's like still very much strong and, and, you know, taking care of herself. And back in the days, she was also like the, a boss of this department, department where they would uh, make the clothing of the soldiers. So not the boss, but she was like the head of, because back in the days, there was like, everything was uh, um, privatized by the government. So everything was governmental structure, but she was basically in a bossy position that I could still see now in her attitude as an elderly woman, she's always like bossing everybody around. So probably I had the influence from, you know, the women in my life and also my aunt. She, she was also like running her own uh, family business together with my uncle. And they would have like this clothing company again. Uh, like they would have factory like producing uh, clothes, which they closed uh, at some point and, and went to the state. So I have this uh, influence, I guess, from the women in the family that maybe subconsciously makes me have this, you know, approach to life and, and have this like fearless approach to things because having a startup is very insecure. And basically you're, you're correct. Like people change after they have kids because before having kids, you kind of, are on your own and you kind of have to think of your own ass only. Um, and you're like, okay, I'm taking risks, but if everything goes wrong, it's only me sinking down. Whereas if something goes wrong and you have kids, basically they have no one else to rely on. So you, you kind of have to provide for them and that really forces you to be more um, 
more responsible um, and r risk adverse yeah. let's say yeah and more uh, conservative in your decisions in your actions as well so this is maybe yet another reason um for for the fact that that women tend to be more conservative and to rely on the more secure thing. Also, I've noticed that, uh, yeah, the pay is way different uh, between women and men. I don't know why, but I personally find myself and many of my girlfriends uh, always, when they're asking you, what is your desired salary? The first thing that comes to my mind is like, Oh, poor employer, how can I ask for so much money? That's like a lot of money. Think about them. They have to pay social security, insurance, and so on. But men don't think about this shit. They're like, oh, I'm worth a lot. Like, I want that much. <laughs> so they get what they want because eventually they're not like underestimating themselves. Whereas as women, we kind of have this empathy probably for the employer or, or we're fearing that we would look uh, to, um, how do you say this, um, that we have the nerve to ask this much money and we're always afraid that we will be told off. We're like, hey, this is out of the world. But I grew to understand that what is the worst that can happen? They can tell you, no, we cannot afford this or no, we're not paying this. So you're not going to be laughed at for asking more. You will be... Uh, Right on the contrary, you will be more appreciated because you know your price. And this is how things happen with business as well. I noticed that when something is for free, people tend to not be so dedicated to it. Whereas when you give a little money, you're more determined to, you know, get what you have spent for. Uh, so when you invest more in an asset, you tend to, you know, take care of them more. And you actually eventually start giving them more responsibility just to... Um, justify the fact that you're paying them a certain amount. Uh, so maybe this is also one of the breaking points between uh, genders in, in the professional world. Yeah, I think also you're, you, we are lucky for one thing in Bulgaria is that we have had that, those communist years and then maybe we have less this culture of, you know, expecting the woman to stay at home and taking care of the home and the kids. So at least this, I always say, at least this is the only positive thing that back then everyone was working. So, uh, for example, for me, it's not weird because I always knew, I don't know, my grandma was, uh, uh, she studied ch chemistry, so she worked uh, in that. Uh, my other grandma, she also works, so it's not something unreasonable to think that uh, a woman has a profession and... Uh, so f for me, that's a very positive um, cultural thing that out of the, all the negativity, it was something good. And um, um, so I'm curious to go back to, to your startup and to Wisp. <clears throat> uh, you mentioned all these uh, inter iterations, <laughs> uh, all this process uh, of starting out of uh, the company. <clears throat> um, so you said you started two years ago. Uh, is there already a version of Wisp that it's actually delivering to clients? And how yeah. long was the period before before having something that delivers to clients? And how did you survive those months? This uh, They call it uh, runway, right? The, the time where you have to basically live out of <laughs> savings or something else because you're not making any money as a startup. Yeah, well, um, it, it, it took some time before we founded the company just because of this. So um, for us, it sounded, um, for me, it sounded un unreasonable to open up a company uh, before starting to have clients. So before starting to have some cash coming in. And because there was no one uh, like technically prepared on the team who could actually pull the the actual product off. Um, it happened so that um, we got to offer our services on a consulting base to begin with. Um, I kind of got referred to a client that would be interested in what we would do. And this is how it all started. So basically, uh, a little after we, we found our first client, we, we opened up the company because we had to issue invoices and stuff like that. 
Um, and we were kind of forced to, to work on a consulting base before really pulling off the product, which really helped us because working directly with customers in a more brick and mortar way gives you the know-how. So before starting to work with clients, everything is way more conceptual. So everything is based on assumptions. This is why also investors don't tend to invest in startups who have zero traction because once you start servicing clients and, and getting real cash back from them, this is the moment where, when you really understand that you're entering the real world and not the ideal world anymore. Um, so this is when um, me and the team founded the company and this is exactly when three days before we signed the documents and the uh, in the registry um, to open up the company, my dad got sick with cancer. Um, well, or we discovered that he, he had like a huge brain tumor. Uh, so it was like a very adverse coincidences. But before that, we had won this several awards that I mentioned uh, about and kind of the, the, the small amount of cash we got from there, we invested in the project. In the meantime, I was living off of my savings, as you mentioned, uh, because like, yeah, I'm not deriving from a rich family. So I, I started like being self-sustained ever since, yeah, the second or third year of university, basically scholarships, working on the side. I would also like do some modeling. Mm -hmm. Of course, I would live in Milan, so that, that was a great opportunity to combine with studies and, and I could earn some cash on the side. Which So you were earning up. money as a model and then doing architecture on the side, right? <laughs> <I'm just> <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it was no. a joke. I had a friend, a, a guy in Italy who was also modeling and he would tell me that he would, how much he would get paid for this photo shooting. I was like, why are you even doing this? <laughs> Well, actually, uh, guys also tend to earn more. Really? Oh, my money. God. This is ridiculous. Ladies, you have to get your shit together. <laughs> because there are guys, there's supply and demand. There's less guys in the industry uh, who would, like, be fit for the job. And there's more girls. Uh, it's the same as architecture. Architecture is uh, not well paid and, and actually... I was thinking about this yesterday before uh, before the call that why it happened so that architecture was such a popular and, and desired job and it was so cool and posh to be an architect. Well, back in the times, there was way more demand. Imagine all these people who had to be draughtsmen and draw like on huge pieces of paper on the floor and there was no like uh, technological uh, means to, to pull off a project fast. So you needed to have maybe 100 people working on a project. Whereas now with all the new software, with all the, um, you know, algorithmic architecture, with all the uh, CAT and BIM software, we can work on cloud. We can work from both sides of the world on the same project simultaneously. So it gets built way faster. So eventually with the growth of technology and growth of innovation and startups probably that uh, all these like softwares were at the very beginning. Um, I feel like the demand got reduced in architecture, but the supply stayed the same. So many people would uh, graduate Politecnico di Milano, for example. There were like a hundred thousand people graduating each year and there would be only limited amount of jobs. So what I noticed on the market is that people would come to the job interview and basically offer themselves for free to the company. And the company started learning, hey, I can exploit people because they want to do this, because they do it for their CV, they do it for their brighter future. So they would end up working like for years in a row without being paid and living with their parents. Um, and yeah, th this is the supply and demand basically. It's the same with, uh, with all the markets, it's the same with, with the fashion industry. Uh, so there's always like more women proactively willing to get in. But then eventually, because of the conditions, they tend to like step back eventually or in modeling because of, of age. And there's always like less guys coming in in modeling, but then they're more valued because there's less. 
it's the same with the tech industry. Like now I noticed the huge difference between uh, how architects are being treated in their offices and how developers are being treated by their bosses. So com compared to architects, basically the architects are treated as maids in somebody's household and developers are treated as kings and queens because right now the supply of developers is less than the demand. There's such a huge demand for all kinds of like uh, technical people who would, you know, write code or do automations or um, build the next AI solution. Um, and I feel like eventually in time, this would also change because there would be the birth of no code solutions. So basically, um, you know, any anybody would be able to, you know, uh, build a little website. Even now, everybody's capable of building a little website with these no-code tools that are very much user interface, um, user-friendly and easy to, to work around and to find your way to actually build something that is completely no-code and it had, like, it can have great integrations. There are some uh, products on the market that are already built on this kind of uh, um, like technical infrastructure. So I feel like this is also going to shift, and I'm very curious to see what's going to happen with the, you know, uh, with the job market and, and also the tech industry. As we can see now in the Silicon Valley, basically there's like epic layoffs because of you know, the cutting off funding and uh, many people in the tech industry actually got laid off. And now these people are, most of them jobless. And this is a phenomenon probably in the tech industry because, you know, it has never been that um, good developers or good product or project managers would, would stay home. Of course, the first person to be cut off uh, the, the supply chain would be, HRs, um, office administrators, and this kind of like, let's call them overhead to the company because they're not generating real uh, real revenue with, with their work, but they're very important and vital to the company, but still they're being laid off. And I don't know what the future of architecture and, and the technological industry is going to look like, but um, I feel like the supply and demand kind of messes up the whole situation for architecture. And yeah, uh, I, I feel like the idea of your professional life that you get as an architectural student is a bit more, um, huh. it's, it's a bit more glittery than it actually is in reality. So whereas with startups, pretty much you are more unlimited on on the approach because you create your own approach and you set your own standards. But I, I pulled you off uh, from the initial question, which was like how you managed to leave the first year. And then also I'm curious, uh, once you got the first clients, uh, you said you got some investors. So how how did that work? So the first year you work, uh, you basically survive on your savings somehow and then started having clients and then did some people... Do you have also in Bulgaria a good, a good community <clears throat> for um, these venture capitalists? Or did you go on international level? All very interesting things. Yeah, well, um, actually, it took some eight or ten months between the first client and the time that we got funded. Um, and actually in the meantime, I was doing some architectural work and, uh, you know, graphic design and marketing, uh, digital marketing jobs on the site as a freelancer. So I, at some point I, I, I had to start making my own living as well because my, I was running out of, uh, personal cash. <laughs> so, uh, this is how I continued surviving and basically, um, with the with the closing of the curtains of all borders, let's call them like this, uh, during COVID, our business really suffered. Because imagine you're like a newborn company with like one business client um, or like several business clients, but they're small clients uh, that bring you like a little amount of users with no technical people on the team. Uh, and then there's COVID. And then there's like, 
everything was frozen and people were like, what the hell are we going to do? Everybody's going to die. Uh, so it was such a panic situa panicking situation for me as well. I, at some point I, I started like looking for options and I was like, what are, what are we doing? What relocation? There's no relocation right now. We don't even know when the borders are going to be opened again. So we had to pivot and adjust to the fact that people would come back to their own country so we could help them figure their uh, healthcare rights so they could reinstate their healthcare rights by moving them from the place they used to be to the place they would be. And we got to save a lot of money for a lot of customers, like up to like 2,500 uh, euros per person from, you know, savings and, and not paying the health insurance twice. Uh, into different countries. So this was something that helped us kind of survive. In the meantime, um, again, we got, I applied for a grant, again, through this uh, pre-accelerator program that I was in. Um, they told me that there was this, like, grant uh, subsidy that was given away to, like, young uh, companies and entrepreneurs. So basically, I applied for it. Uh, we got approved, and I got another little funding of 5,000 euros that could help me actually hire um, our first basically per paid person on the team. Um, and in the meantime, I, I, I met this very uh, brilliant uh, developer. Uh, he was a full, he is a full stack um, a basically developer with a lot of years of experience who was also co-founder in the team. Um, unfortunately, he left uh, some half a year ago because uh, um, he needed to take care of a, a three or four or four people family. So <laughs> uh, you can imagine that if the startup doesn't go like uh, exploding very quickly, people tend to like want to go back to stability and maybe I don't know what happened there. But but still, he managed to to help us pull off the minimum viable product together with the girl that we were paying. Um, and we, we managed to, to build really a minimum viable product version of our software. And then at this point, I had already started uh, discussing with investors the potential to fundraise. Um, and yeah, what where happened did you, is that... In, where did you find these investors? Through your community of the acceleration? Uh, online. Oh, online, okay. No, online. I was just checking some venture capital funds in in Bulgaria, mainly, and I, I saw the Apply Now link, and I did. And I had to, like, send materials, and I, I had to record the video where I pitched the product. I had to upload the pitch deck. This is the presentation that uh, startups used to, you know, demonstrate their idea. Um, then they called me and they were like, hey, would you like to come for a meeting? Um, and then I did. And then basically we got um, a funding, like a term sheet. Um, we negotiated it. Well, I negotiated it mainly. And then in August 2021, uh, we raised our first pre-seed funding with uh, Innovation Capital Bulgaria. Um, it was basically one-fourth of what we were asking for. Um, and of course the valuation was not, um, the dream valuation because, you know, if you're like such an early stage startup, basically the investor is taking way higher risk. Uh, so you kind of have to give in a little bit more, uh, company shares for, for the sake of, you know, getting the funding and, and, you know, accelerating things a bit more, um, because it's crazy how slow things can happen when you are not venture backed and when you don't have the cash because you know you really need to ex extend stuff in time in order to have the financial resource or the the time to do them because you, you can never force someone to work quicker and faster if they're not paid like because they probably have their their own regular job so it's it's a very subtle game between finding the balance of motivating people, inspiring them, because this is how you basically build your team at the very beginning when you don't have the big cash to pay like big salaries. Um, and yeah, eventually you you start having the um, 
the venture backing, which also gives you some recognition, which also attracts more people to the team. So it's like once you do this, the, the cycle starts. And basically, yeah, we raised our, our first round and this really um, has been giving us the opportunity to live uh, until now because we really went through some pivots. Uh, we launched the product in September, October 2021. And then we, we actually started having some customer requests, like individual customer requests, real um, people who would interact with the software and give us real feedback. Before launching the software live, basically, the paid version of it, uh, we had created a little pool of uh, you know friends and, and people we knew uh, with the appeal, hey, use this 100% discount code to test our software and give us feedback. So we basically, the community would help us debug it. And once it started working pretty much okay, then then we could launch it to the general public and, and start monetizing it. So this is how it happened. Of course, it didn't go without yet another pivot because COVID was more or less over. Um, and we decided, hey, now it's about time to open it up more and, and you know bring the focus more to relocation and not healthcare because healthcare made it even more niche. Like uh, transferring healthcare is, yeah, it's just a fragment of what you can do related to moving from a country to a country. Then I figured, hey, let's start working with companies that recruit employer, uh, foreign employees because then you have like bigger numbers. Like it's it. the the tricky part of uh, of our business is uh, the go to market. So how do you get this client exactly in the moment when they relocate? Whereas when you talk to their employer, the employer is the one contacting you because they want to relocate the employee because they want them to start working in. August, let's say. So they're the driver, and then you have like um, more regulated situation because you're sure that the person has a working contract. So you're sure that their use cases, employee use case, uh, like this is more or less how our, our software works at the beginning. It, it asks you where are you from, where are you moving to, how long are you staying. And then based on your answers, it provides you the right uh, procedure that you have to track and follow. Um, and basically when you log in, um, you, you, you tell the software what your situation is. We pop up the service that would fit your, your case. You make the payment and eventually you start going step by step. And let's say step one is fill this document. You put your data inside. We migrate them on the right application forms. Then, um, especially now in Bulgaria, we started being able to deliver some of the documents online. So we kind of close the cycle and people don't really have to go to institutions anymore. But they just like fill in their document, they sign it electronically and we deliver it online to some institutions. And then we um, basically solve their problems or like get them registered. Of course, some procedures related to migration are still very much physical and this is still something we're struggling with. Um, but especially with individual customers, we have managed accomplishing uh, more um, independent uh, workflow, meaning that the user is capable of, of self-servicing themselves. Whereas with business customers now, we, we're kind of tending to have a bit more of an agency look because we really need to provide also this communication to their employees, um, which goes a bit away from the idea of self-service and of completely technological startup. But um, in the same time, this helps us learn way more about the potential potentialities there are with the different use cases and the different customers. So basically, it's like an algorithm in our head, right? You're learning more. Uh, the more situations you discover there are, existing and um so yeah this is how the software looks like we had to change of course by changing the the segment like uh, switching from b2c so business to consumer to b2b we had to also change the you know the way we would present ourselves to the world the landing page the user onboarding the user flow even the domain so it's not with health anymore it's with dot world 
um, because we're not dealing with healthcare anymore only um, and not even it's not even the primary thing that we do it's more about relocation um, so what so, else what else it's the main what are the main groups of issues that people that relocate have a part of healthcare well getting uh, permits and residency because being a european citizen it's still it's a bit um uh, complex to get your tax code and to start like to be a registered citizen in in a country uh imagine that you have to get a visa that you have to apply for a permit and that you're from a third country uh not third country but from countries outside of the eu because we call them third countries in bulgaria it's not an offense um but um yeah the process is very very complex I mean, and if you're not um, acquainted with the law, and if you're not incapable of capable of reading the law, it's basically impossible that you figure your way out. And and do I've you had serve... situations in Italy when I no, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. You're... No, I've had situations in Italy when I be called uh, and asking like administrative representatives in Italian, and they themselves don't know the overall process. They don't have the overview because they're like, oh, I'm dealing with this little task, so I don't know who you have to ask for. And then I'm like, how do I, how, how do I be a comp compliant citizen of this country, like not citizen, but a resident of this country, if the rules are so unclear? So... Yeah. Well, for someone as me that has grown up in Italy, that's no surprise. <laughs> so Italy, it's a very particular place on this planet. <laughs> Especially you've been also in the north part, which is supposed to be the most efficient one. Um, but um, could you, yeah. uh, are you serving people that mainly move from Bulgaria to somewhere or from somewhere to Bulgaria? Or can uh, can somebody use WISP even if they're relocating from, I don't know, Germany to Finland or Germany to Spain, Spain to Germany. Can you do you serve globally or European, European wide or which country are you serving? Because that's a lot of different forms and a lot of different processes. Yeah, uh, for the time being, we have some services for the Italian uh, market as well. So ma mainly now, because uh, we switch to business customers, we operate with uh, companies in Bulgaria who relocate foreigners to here. Whereas for individual customers, we have services in Germany, we have services in Italy, we can help with uh, relocation in Spain, and of course, all the markets where I've lived, like I know the processes and, you know, I speak the language. So uh, the good thing about startups is sometimes, uh, again, the, the game is of supply and demand. If there's a demand, you don't say no to a customer, right? You find a way to help them so um it, it has been very rarely that we say no we cannot help you um we have even like helped with cases in germany let's say people having healthcare transfer issues within healthcare institutions in germany so we've helped with this like we've had um yeah well different cases and and we're trying to operate on more and more um global markets the problem here is that Working with companies, it's a bit more time-consuming and it really um, requires you to build a relationship. So I believe that scaling with companies happens when you basically work with big companies that we have started doing now that have eventually you get referred firsthand by their colleagues in this other market. So then you're way more trustworthy And that makes you landing on a new market way smoother. So we have to be patient a bit with um, business clients abroad now. Uh, but we do have experience with business clients who are not based in Bulgaria and people who have been relocating to, to different markets. So, so your clients exactly. are mainly now businesses that are like companies that relocate their people. Yeah, we have mainly focused our, our forces on businesses. And we have the services for individual clients, but it's not that we do some special marketing or, or advertising. It's like it's just when people land on our page, uh, we help them. Um, but it's not, it's not the main 
um, segment that we're servicing. Like I, I love all, all of our clients and I feel like each one of them is also giving us a lot of know-how on how even the product could work better. So how you can improve the whole user interaction with, with what you're offering them. So I always tend to ask for feedback and for me, criticism is a good thing because then we can actually improve. And um, we have, like, really based on what, what I've heard as a feedback from clients, I've managed to um, change some features or modify things so it would be easier for them to handle it. And I believe that the more we go, the more we're going to be to make it um, also fit for, for companies. So, so the main goal now is to make the product more of a SaaS, right? It's a software as a service, so giving this product to companies and their HR or legal departments use it to process the case, to plan, track, um, to get redirected to the right uh, places where they have to, for example, make a job post or something. So everything is like put together. And um, in my head, this is really going to revolutionize the way people approach administration. It's just that it's very much also linked to public administration, which is very much reluctant for to change. So this is still the part that um, we're struggling with. And this is still something that makes probably some investors fear investing in us because we're pretty much um, kind of dependent on public administration and, and governance. The good thing there is that things happen slowly. So if I'm at what happens if this uh, application form changes, my answer is it hasn't changed since uh, 1997. When do you think it's going to change the next time? It's probably going to change once and then it's going to stay the same for another like uh, 10 years. So this is something that is actually beneficial in our case. And the other beneficial thing is actually one of the good outcomes of COVID is that um, the COVID pandemic kind of forced some institutions to open up their web portals and to make stuff a bit more digitalized. So this is something that helped us as well, because now we can deliver some stuff also online and they don't require physical presence. So, yeah. Yeah, that's true. And I have one last question that I'm really curious. Now you've been two years uh, into this new uh, venture, let's say. Is your lifestyle better than it was an ar than you were an architect or you still have to work super long hours to make this thing happen? <laughs> I have to work longer hours, but at my own pace. And this makes me happier. So basically, I... Basically, I never take time off. I've probably taken time off for real time off, meaning that no computer and like far away from work life for one week and two years. Um, but in the same time, I don't feel that it's a burden if I have to, you know, answer my phone at 10 at night or if I have to like, uh, do something for a customer on on Saturday because there was a problem with their account or something, um, and yeah, I I feel like it's it's way much more better paced because I know that okay I can go have um, an earlier dinner and when I go back home I'm gonna finish off and there's nobody who's going to like kill me if I don't. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, also it, it really gave me a different perspective. So I structured the world, the work in a way that we only get to do urgently the very urgent things. Whereas what I noticed in architecture that everything is urgent now. And this is not the case because nobody's going to die. Don't deliver yesterday, right? If you deliver in two days, it, not, nothing is going to happen. I feel like the perception is changed. Now I, I see the same. I also see the same approach in developers. Like our deadline is the 1st of February and I already know that this is not the real deadline. So I have to say it a couple of days earlier and still it's not going to be the deadline. But I cannot change the game because, you know, don't hate the player, hate the game. I mean, 
yeah. I try to <laughs> so you... I, I try to explain that to my colleagues too sometimes, uh, but you know some people are just too much in their bubble. And um, so Greta, thank you very much for 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 sharing with us your story. I think this will be eye opening for many architects that might feel stuck into their architectural life. Uh, I say this with a positive, um, positive vibe, not, I, I'm an architect, I work in the industry, so uh, everyone have different uh, experience. Um, and I want to ask you nowadays, um, if you have some, this is a recurrent topic, we try to create this sort of a, um, I call it the box of inspiration, I ask every guest, if you have some favorite activity that you do when you need to get recharged and re-inspired if you have a favorite book a movie if you do sports or you have a favorite place doesn't have to be all of these things you have to pick what is your thing <laughs> uh, sports is definitely one thing that all of us should do because i have really noticed that when i do sports i'm way more relaxed and you know i, I get to recharge um even if it's something at home for 15 minutes, I really tend to give this advice to people, even though I don't respect it personally always, but I tend to do it because it makes me feel more mentally uh, centered. And I have a dog. <laughs> I adopted a dog uh, together with my partner um, four months ago. And this is really the a source of relaxation right now because when you see it, it's like so carefree. It's there and it's like just lying down. And I'm like, I wish I would be you. Like your life is fantastic. <laughs> so, yeah, this, this is nice. Well, I, I used to have way much more hobbies, but unfortunately I don't have that much time to practice them anymore. So, yeah. Well, it was I a good question. It made, it made I, I wish you I wish you that uh, Wisp grows at a faster pace so that uh, maybe you can uh, at some point uh, leave off your stocks and hire a CEO and just uh, have time for your hobbies. <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> and it would be great to see to, to see this company from Bulgaria going global. I hope so. I, I really hope actually the goal is not to to retire. The goal is to really make something positive. I it might sound cheesy, but I really feel like in order to have lived well, you, you need to leave some footprint that is um, nice for, for the next generation. So, yeah, if, if we can do this, then we have succeeded in doing something small, but something good. <laughs> Definitely. I wish you all the best. And I always uh, say this was your first time on the Creative Insider, but it doesn't have to be the last one. So... As the podcast grow, we want to give back the stage to the people that have been part of the of the journey. So thank you very much, Greta, and all the best to you and, and Wisp. Good luck to you too. It's it's a nice podcast and I'm wishing you uh, as well to, to grow bigger. And so next time we, we speak, I, I would be happy to have your like millions of people <laughs> <of> audience. <laughs> Let's go. Have a nice day. You too.